I was hoping to give this talk under different circumstances tonight, that the COVID containment measures might be lifted and we might meet once more in our common home at St. Augustine's. I was planning on wearing a Spider-Man onesie, ironically and mockingly, but nonetheless in keeping with tonight's theme. And jokingly commenting in my opening, it's been a long time since you've been able to gather here. And I like to say it's really nice to see you all again in person, but that would be a lie. Something funny and clever and witty and genius and unexpected and hilarious and obnoxious and overdone and overkill like that. Alas, all my plans in this regard have come to naught, gone to pot. But a silver lining remains. We still get to do the exact same talk despite the distance. A talk where I will compare and contrast superheroes and saints and hope to convince you to do that thing everyone secretly lives for the drag and drop in the desktop trash bin, followed by a click on empty trash, so as to hear, but for a fleeting moment, that ear-smacking, syrupy crinkle and crunch of files formerly filed away safely, now gone. To the superheroes, if you needed me to give you uh, further elaboration. In this talk, I'm gonna list a few well-known superheroes, diss track roast them, and then explain why some saints actually do the superhero special power better and so that's why you should explain, you should like the saint better than the superhero. The saint is a real person, emphasis on real, who by the grace of God lived a life of heroic virtue and now intercedes on our behalf in heaven while beholding in perpetuity the beatific vision. The superhero is a fake, characterized literary device, emphasis on fake, for whom even the upfront advertised artificiality of the comic book slash action flick universe does not adequately function to high pressure hose off the gallons of toolboxosity, cringe queasiness, and general free floating, free floating crowbar me in the throat distaste of the genre. That too, I guess, is why I think you might consider liking saints more than superheroes. And better still, actually learning something about these exceptional men and women. Look, if you wanna like superheroes, go ahead. Father Mike Schmitz likes them enough to have done multiple YouTube videos about them. A couple named Jackie and Bobby have an article on their blog entitled, The Catholicity of Captain America. There are articles online entitled, Five Catholic Superheroes in Comic Books, Superhero Catholics, The Catholic Nerd's Guide to Superheroes, and I know everything about DC and Marvel, but I'm still afraid to talk to women. That last article is fictitious, but sounds believable, right? If you like superheroes, keep on liking them. There's nothing wrong with it. Some people like baseball, baseball fans. Others like a $3,000 of Screaming Eagle Cabernet Sauvignon, wine connoisseurs. Others like superheroes, idiots. This is America. You like what you like and good for you. But the serious Catholic and cultural problem revolves around what Christ taught in his Sermon on the Mount, that you cannot serve God and mammon. James Papandrea's book, to cite one example, entitled From Star Wars to Superman, Christ Figures in Science Fiction and Superhero Films, implies as much. When science fiction is so, so nearly biblical, it can, rather than point to God, distract people from real salvation history in favor of the confectioned pseudo-story. Wait, 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 you, you protest. Papandrea is probably saying, look, this genre is art done right. It leads people to faith. Fair argument, but allow me to pose a few counter questions. Do you think your average 16 year old kid would rather an all expenses paid trip for a pilgrimage to Rome or another type of pilgrimage to Comic Con? Do you think it's more likely the same kid has read all of Stan Lee's comics or all of the Bible? Do you think it's more likely he can name and describe 25 superheroes or 25 saints? Are we winning the culture war? And how, by the way, is that new evangelization going? You cannot serve God and mammon. Perhaps you cannot have as role models, superheroes and saints. You might just find yourself to, devoted to the one and despising the other. But where to place that devotion and derision if we must? Ernest Hemingway once described another author's work as non-alcoholic beer. Better to drink water. Saints are beer. They are real whereas superheroes are near beer, a gross and insulting half facsimile of culinary art that tastes best pour down the drain. Near beer, so close to beer, yet so far away. 
superheroes, so much like Christ, so much like the saints, and yet upon further investigation, often not at all. Returning a final time to beer and introducing our first saint of the night, every here of Bridget of Ireland. She's one of those country's uh, patrons, along with all the limelight St. Patrick. And just to be clear, pursuant to the identified problem of knowledge deficiencies regarding saints, yes, St. Patrick is a real person. No, St. Patrick is not some kind of collective identifier for green clad lads vomiting onto New York City streets during the early morning hours of March 18th, following the previous night's festivities. St. Bridget, born two decades after the death of St. Augustine of Hippo, imagined heaven as a lake of beer. Her reputed superpower, if you will, turning water into beer. That by itself is enough to carry any aforementioned, of any parts of my aforementioned thesis to a soft landing in a safe harbor later on. But I'm not going to stop there. Four sections. Healing powers. Second, wealth put at the service of the common and greater good. Thirdly, intelligence and or mental powers. And last, because best, because certainly most catch-all on anything goes, overall superhero-ness. Frame this essay. I will first list the relevant superheroes, then the complementary, complementary and ultimately more impressive. Have I already mentioned more real too? Have I, have I already said that enough? Saints. And so on healing, our first consideration, Wolverine, a diminutive X-Men mutant with a nasty disposition and nose for the fight, who I kid you not, is also Canadian. And you thought Canada could not sink any lower. The kid you not refers to my initial surprise that really other, other countries traffic in this type of stuff? Uh, okay. He has this thing called the healing factor, which enables him to recover from injuries with lightning speed, resist poisons along with bacterial infections and viruses, and an anti-aging quality that keeps his super centenarian body looking in prime physical shape. That the healing factor does not suppress the pain he feels from being injured is a consolation. Really, can't someone make another movie where Wolverine is in that honey badger clip and the honey badger kills him like it does to all the other poor creatures therein? It's just, just a suggestion. Wolverine's healing powers are impressive, but how do they stack up compared to Christina the Astonishing? She died of a seizure during her 20s, only to resurrect from the dead during her own funeral. First impression, Christina greater than Wolverine. Second take, Wolverine owned. The impressiveness of his healing factor utterly destroyed. Like all good saints, filled to, the brim, filled to the brim with love of God and neighbor, Christina told people that God had brought her back to life solely to suffer for souls detained in purgatory and for the conversion of poor sinners exiled in this valley of tears. Suffer she did. This indestructible, invincible saint forthwith throwing herself into burning furnaces, staying submerged in icy winter waters for days on end, running full speed through thorns, all for the repertory mortification, which, needless to say, she added to her daily more normal deprivations and penances, simply so more souls might be saved, the most real of all real issues. Spoiler alert, her healing factor was so powerful, she passed unscathed through all these trials. St. Vincent Ferrer was also reputed to be blessed with the most, most healthy healing gift of all, bringing people back from the dead. The story goes that St. Vincent once appeared at a hanging to plead for clemency for the condemned man. A stretcher happened to pass by upon which lay a corpse at the same time. Is this man guilty? St. Vincent asked the corpse. He is not, was the response from the formerly dead body now flush with life. Vincent offered the just dead, now alive man, a reward for helping him crack this case. No thanks, said the man. Whilst dead, he had learned that he was saved, and so presumably was content, no, no, rapturously happy, in an eye has not seen, ear has not heard way, to return to his true home in heaven, and so lied back down and died again. But so, on to comparison number two, wealth put to the service of others. Example A, Batman, or perhaps I should say Bruce Wayne. Wayne, oligarchic industrialist and owner of the philanthropic Wayne Enterprises, Inc., 
whose vast personal, personal fortune enables him to purchase and fine tune the most cutting edge equipment in his nighttime Batman role, ridding Gotham City of crime and corruption. The formula here is simple. I use my money to buy things that help the people against bad guys who want to hurt them. This is money well spent. My question is, if Bruce Wayne is so rich he can afford anything, why does he buy things that make him look like such a massive, insufferable tool? If his outfit was trying to say, I have no fashion sense whatsoever, my MO is to disable my adversaries with laughter, them laughing at me, then I strike, mission accomplished. But one does not have to dress like Batman to put material blessings to good use. The 11th century queen, St. Margaret, known as the Pearl of Scotland, was widely noted for her tireless devotion to the poor, especially orphans, even washing the feet of society's most neglected out of imitation of Christ. Margaret's constant charity, both of spiritual and material variants, probably staved off 1,000-fold more bad guys who often infest kingdoms like locusts in times of corrupt and selfish rulers in real Scotland than Batman did putting his money towards gadgets fighting comic book characters in fictional Gotham City. Our very own American St. Catherine Drexel, heiress to what in today's money would be a near half billion, B, billion dollar fortune, left it all behind to follow God, providing a truly superhero testament to what matters in this life and the next, what is the real bottom line balance sheet between God and mammon. Tony Stark uses hundreds of millions to produce the latest weapons technology and transform himself into a fighting machine. St. Catherine Drexel refuses use of hundreds of millions of dollars and becomes a spiritual fighting machine in the army of Christ. Iron Man owned. Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati, noted for his good looks, athleticism, and religious devotion. Upon seeing and reciting the rosary on a bus, a friend reportedly exclaimed, Pierre Giorgio, you've become a fanatic. No, he replied, I've remained a Christian also so prodigiously helped the poor and downtrodden of his native, native Turin with food, medicine, anything they needed, that at his funeral, thousands upon thousands lined the streets to pay their respects, as if some great father of the nation political figure had passed. Pierre Giorgio was but 25 years old. Finally, one must not forget the great Bishop of Mira, St. Nicholas gave freely of his material blessings to help the poor, and keeping with Christ's instructions in the Sermon on the Mount, did so in secret, not letting his left hand know what his right hand was doing. Most famously, when he anonymously left sacks of money outside the door of a man with three daughters to help pay their dowry, and so save them from destitution and more tragically still, prostitution. Presents delivered to those in need under the cover of night, the legend of Santa Claus is born. St. Nicholas's hands were good for fighting, too, whereas Batman and Iron Man beat people up over, come on, trivial matters often. St. Nicholas right-hooked the heretic Arius at the Council of Nicaea, his act of force defending the sacred doctrine of Christ's divine nature, Jesus indeed consubstantial with the Father, true God, true man. So even as far as punching power goes, advantage Nicholas. On to number three, superintelligence. Professor X, Charles Francis Xavier, the founder of the X-Men, world authority in genetic theory, inventor of a mutant gene identifying device, a telepath, who could not just read, but control the minds of others. Professor X seems pretty smart, but I have to admit losing some sleep over this one question. If he's really so smart, why does he spend so much time hanging out with X-Men? Our Vanta tradition lacks for intellectual superstars like a beach lacks for grains of sand. Why not consider first the man who in his magisterial summa, rather than reconciling Christ to Aristotle, reconciled Aristotle to Christ. For as our Lord himself said, before Abraham was born, I am. The man who memorized and can perfectly recall all of sacred scripture and the whole corpus of the church fathers yet was so humble, so seemingly dumb ox, that he tolerated being tutored by someone of lesser knowledge without comment or complaint until one day his tutor made a mistake. Our man explained it perfectly and sent the tutor onto his knees begging for a reversal of roles. The man who at the close of his life was told by Christ himself, you have written well of me. This man is an intellectual giant of all times and places, but if you prefer someone more X than Professor X himself, 
check out Padre Pio, for whom mind reading was basic, perhaps boring, so he took up bilocation. Or perhaps third century Egyptian princess St. Catherine, who put mind control to evangelical ends. A convert herself, she attained a personal audience with the Roman emperor of the time, Maxentius, to try and convince him using reason and logic to stop persecuting Christians. The trap the emperor had set, having all of his domain's most renowned philosophers, rhetoricians, and scholars present to debate her failed. Catherine won every single debate, dispensed with every opponent, each and every single question posed. Many of these men converted to the faith. The emperor put her in prison. Bad move. It's another mistake. She converted the whole prison in short order. The emperor was now so angry, especially because she refused while being tortured to stop proclaiming the gospel, that he made his boldest move yet, the one sure to shut her up. He proposed marriage. She turned him down, and so he cut her head off. This after the first attempt to kill her via a spike breaking wheel proved insufficient when the saint touched it and it shattered immediately. She died, by the way, following beheading, something I feel must be mentioned within the context of this essay. She died. She actually died. God, it would seem, having decided she had done enough and was ready to be called home to her eternal reward. Finally, we arrive at the final category, number four, most super of all, most general of all. You know it when you see it, superhero-ness. Here I'm thinking about figures so famous they hardly need any supplementary information. Spider-Man, Wonder Woman, Captain America, The Flash, Aquaman, and the Hulk. No doubt the Man of Steel himself too, and at the very top of the ledger, alien invader sporting impossibly tight tights with weak spots for vapid cliches and kryptonite. If there's one thing this collection of heroes has in common, whether by super strength or super speed, sometimes airborne, is an uncanny knack for finding the bad guys and defeating them while, and this is all important, while being able to do and withstand practically anything in the performance of their duties. In other words, they're super and all around. Well, have you ever heard of the following saints, all of whom possessed a similar knack for supernatural exploits, like St. Joseph Cupertino, nicknamed the Flying Saint, because you'll never guess it, he could. He would levitate and just keep levitating. I mean, if you could do it, wouldn't you do this? The superiors of his order, well, they deemed this phenomenon disruptive and eventually kept him in cells by himself. Perhaps the final words on Super St. Joseph Cupertino have been penned by authors Richie Craven, Dustin Kosky, and Dagmeyer Bear in an article entitled Six Saints with Superpowers Straight from the Marvel Universe. I'm quoting directly now from their article. Most saints use their miraculous powers to help their fellow man, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, or something equally altruistic. As far as we know, there is only one saint who used his miraculous powers just to look really, really badass. How about St. Thomas More, martyr, patron of politicians and statesmen, even honored in the USSR for the ideas found in his magisterial classic, Utopia? so perfectly trusting in God, so super in his faith, that he joked while his executioner, while, with his executioners on the way to decapitation. Or St. Lawrence, who, while being grilled alive, quipped, turn me over, I'm done. Or St. Denis, the first bishop of Paris, who, like Moore and Catherine of Egypt, lost his head, except that even this did not prevent him from preaching. Legend has it that after the incident, he simply picked up his now separated head and set out for a six kilometer walk. Only then did he expire. Or reported the 18 foot tall St. Christopher, patron of travelers, whose insatiable quest for power manifested in an uncompromising commitment to serve only the most powerful Lord in existence. Ferrying people across a dangerous river, he almost drowned with a tiny child on his shoulders, who got heavier and heavier by the step. If you're guessing, this child was probably the divine child himself, because you know this saint's name means Christ bearer. And so it was probably at this moment that he first encountered the most powerful Lord he wished to serve, then right, that's correct. Or finally, how about Saint Moses the Black? Ever hear of him? 
a guy who, like St. Christopher, liked to, liked to ford rivers, except that Moses preferred doing this with a knife in his mouth, all the better to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat upon reaching the other side of the shore. St. Moses was a bandit, a brawler, a bad guy, too intimidating to define. But these people being precisely God's people, for where sin is found, grace abounds all the more, Moses converted after seeking refuge at a monastery and being won over by the monk's way of life. Sometime afterwards, Moses, at this time a monk himself, went full Chuck Norris in single-handedly wrecking a crew of robbers with but his bare hands. He brought them to the abbot who forgave these men on the spot and ordered them released. These men, shocked by the abbot's gratuitous show of mercy, like the former bad guy Moses himself also converted and joined the monastic community. Like all good superhero slash Norris slash Terminator type figures, St. Moses the Black died during battle at the hands of another band of bad guys, this time professional warriors later in life. But only after he first helped his brothers escape to freedom by volunteering to stay behind with a few other monks to fight King Leonidas at Thermopylae style, the entire invading army. That St. Moses the Black was at this time more than 70 years old does not seem to be a trivial detail. If you want to like superheroes, go ahead, keep on liking them. It's fun to joke, but I honestly don't believe there's anything wrong with the genre. And in fact, find the movies quite fun. The special effects, great. A nice way to spend a few hours on a lazy summer afternoon with family. Perhaps even we can hope that superheroes can serve as an evangelical tool. The themes of good triumphing over evil, of helping those who need it most, pointing in the end to the God who is goodness itself, pointing towards the ultimate triumph of good over evil in our own existence. But one should not be confused for a moment that any superhero can hold the dimmest candle to saints, to the real men and women whose examples don't just point to God, but are infused by God's presence and plan. And while you can like Superman and Wonder Woman, do not forget the everlasting importance of the only woman worthy of being called wonderful, the majestic queen of heaven and earth, mother to us all and mother to the real Superman, the God-man, Jesus Christ. Thank you.